Whether we're in the classroom or at the color bar, we're always having a great time at Paul Mitchell, the school St. Louis. Being a student at Paul Mitchell gives you a lot of opportunity for when you're ready to get out into the real world. Thank you for taking a sneak peek of our campus, and we can't wait for you to come and see what a Paul Mitchell education can do for you. We're back at the 2014 U.S. Chess Championships. I love that hair commercial. Do you think I should go purple? Jen, you look good. <laughs> Any color suits you. Every right. color So suits. as we went to break, we were kind of mystified. And yeah, there goes the purple. Um, in person, it looks purple. In the monitor, it looks kind of like a bluish purple. Yeah. But I, regardless, it's just really fun to, to watch, uh, watch that blue hair go. I think you girls have too much fun at the moment. Um, we We are um, being critical, perhaps overly so, of Alex Linderman's decision to trade knights early on b6 and th and the reason why we were critical of alex's decision is we felt that this rook on a7 that has been kind of buried away in the corner is now uh resurfaced into the battle uh open d file yada 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 uh black is back in in shape however i recall a fantastic idea from the World Chess Championship match 1990 by Gary Kasparov against Anatoly Karpov. In a situation from the Zaitsev, there was a bishop on this uh, long diagonal, a knight on f6, Karpov was white, Karpov was black, pardon me, Gary Kasparov was white, and Gary made an absolute stunning discovery with this quiet, quiet move F2, F3. Very interesting. What are you trying to do, round up my C-pawn? Precisely. Well, the first thing I'm trying to do with this uh, structure of F3 and E4 is to kill two, bit, two pieces. I'm trying to say that the knight on F6 is out of the game and misplaced, it's on a bad circuit, and that uh, and and the same is true of the bishop, that this diagonal is now shut down. But you said it precisely right. I'm an old pawn grubber. I love grabbing pawns. And in this case, I've got my eye set on knight d2 takes c4. Obviously, if Lenderman can capture that pawn without worrying about his center blowing up, um, bad things can happen right now for Okobian. He's got to find a way of generating counterplay very quickly before Lenderman seizes the initial uh, so seizes the game. So you're predicting F three in this very position. I'm saying that F two F three. I had this memory from the game. F three. Oops, oops, wrong button. F three by no means is the only move in the position. A uh, similar idea might be, for example, to play rook on D to E one. I'm attracted to F three because I'm thinking that in case of, for example, say Queen B seven, just to make a move. I could drop back with my bishop on f2, and I like this bishop being on this diagonal, comfortably next to my king, uh, offering both offense and defense. Okay, so... Lenderman for choice, I'm saying, after the move, f2, f3. <coughs> How about some tactical tries? Oh, God, I really hesitate to recommend a <laughs> move g4. Well, exactly. <laughs> it's blowing that's up my position, but I That's kind I of what like I'm trying to induce. g4, then maybe... Um, maybe I can loosen up your e4 pawn after all, but of course it's weakening me Precisely. tremendously, and I'm not Precisely. happy about that. That's why I also wonder if maybe retreating to the square um, e3 was another possibility, just so that I don't even have that an option. Or, or you like you like the weakness so much that you'd rather have just induce me to play it. Well, but, uh, bishop f2, just to uh, keep it by the king. But if you but. Uh, what you're saying is you like the more aggressively posted bishop e3. Now d4 is really kind of off the menu because h6 is just hanging. It's going to exactly. be really hard to get it in. Sure. But in any case, f3, let's see wh what has happened. Because well, f3 what? has been played, yes. Well, okay, so Alex, too, has it in his mind, because that game that Kasparov won was an absolute, absolute gem. And I remember it made a huge impression on me. I was at the World Championship match that year, following it uh, live in person. And F2, F3. Little boy. Oh, yeah, I was really young. I was just like, 
out of grade school or something like that. <laughs> Don't know Six where. Six or seven, there yeah. There you go. Now you're talking, Jeff. So, uh, little I, Wander, little Yasser. <laughs> right. Uh, so I'm thinking that Acobian has some very, very serious issues to solve. Um, and I don't see a good active counter. Now, you mentioned the move uh, G4Gen. Maybe, uh, maybe you got to do it even if you don't want to do it. But Before Void has a chance to get back to E3. Or just simply play knight takes c4 and rounding up the pawn for free. So g4, the, desperation or not, might be box, as although we Although the say. funny thing is, e5 here could come, come into the position as well. Um, In this specific, uh, well, I haven't chased you yet, so e5, I could, oh, yeah, I right. could, get, I could pick up a tempo against the bishop. Um, and then I, that also cuts me off from the uh, e3 square. Yes, exactly. Kind of annoying. Well, I mean, you could say, okay, fine, bishop e3 takes, takes, and you've got uh, uh, black's pawns look pretty scraggly. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't be happy about this. A no, uh, this doesn't now, look fun at all. Well, again, uh, a fellow like Hikaru, where the position's terribly in balance with all kinds of crazy tactics, may embrace this uh, type of position. VAR is not that player. Var is a player who likes really, really solid, quiet, simple positions uh, where he can analyze deeply. These positions are chaotic and not in his character. Well, speaking of Hikaru, he's also tweeted to us that G5 is often a strong move, so he wants us to stop hating on G5. <laughs> okay. And he says, uh, we shouldn't forget Kramnik Nakamura with 12 G5 from the London Chess Classic in 2010 either. You want to make a wild guess who won that game? I'm going to go, okay, just a second, here it comes. Maybe you remember. With Nakamura. <laughs> he did win that game. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I think the point, the point is very clear. If nothing about Hikaru is a move, then everything about the character of a player. Yeah. And we know that chess. Oh, I'm sorry. Just as Marisa is getting uh, hooked up there. So G5 was played by Hikaru. I think it was somebody's birthday that game. I remember there was a, it was a, Nakamura's birthday falls during the London Chess Classic every year because he's in so, December. So it was a birthday present from, I think from Vladimir to People Hikaru. normally do badly on their birthdays, but I guess that I was have, an exception. I have. So I you, have. homework for you guys. Um, look up the Vladimir Kram Kramnik Hikaru Nakamura question and also look up the World Championship game that Yasser Sarawan was referring to, the Zaitsev between Kasparov and Karpov. And if you tweet both of that, those to the hashtag US Chess Champs, we will be very happy. Yes. So, and we find, we've got Maurice Ashley, he's back with us, and he has a comment on this G5 debate. Well, again, G5, I'm the kind of player who G5 uh, is a move I love to play. Uh, I remember one of my almost greatest games ever, <laughs> almost greatest games. I played against Patrick Wolf, who is a two time US champion. And I, the, the game we played, I had the black pieces. And in a moment that seemed logical for me to capture a pawn back, I played this move G5, and it set up all kinds of mating ideas. The reason I say almost because I got into time pressure and couldn't figure out the win. It would have been one of those scintillating wins that uh, I would have been really proud of. Played a very nice game, but got into time pressure and blew it. That said, I think that the move G5 is also related to the character of a player. I mean, you can see an idea that makes a lot of sense, but not necessarily want to play it because it's just not quite you. And a guy like Nakamura, you say G5, I think, okay, it's good. Don't have to talk to him about it. But a guy like Akobi and you see G5, especially in a situation like this, and you go, I don't know. He'd much, he could play G5, know it's good, and much rather that pawn be back on G7, that he has a different way to solve problems. No, no doubt this guy's a very strong player, but a lot of your character comes to a chessboard and a chess game, how you wish to play. Komsky, for some reason, he always gets the kind of game he wants when he's playing for the championships. Notice how solid his position is. He's just keeping things under control. You say, you have to win, Gata. That's nice. I'm still going to play solid. That's how I do. And that's why I'm a little bit concerned, not about the move G5, but about the player who's playing it in a critical situation and the, the fear factor that goes in because you, you say, if I play G5, do I play G4 as well? How do you handle yourself overall? 
Got and it. we do have some extra moves, actually. So mm -hmm. Maurice has no problem with g5, but g4, Just further kill. weakening, um, right. has been played. Probably Ecobian thought that he had to get some counterplay in this position. Otherwise, mm -hmm. it was going to be a pawn deficit on a c4. Exactly. Bishop e3 was played. Attacking so. the pawn on h6. This is the what we thought uh, a chaotic position might arise. But mostly chaotic for black. I mean, white seems pretty well protected. Well, exactly. And again, it's just this feeling that uh, Verusian has that it's it's not his style. It's not the way he approaches chess. You know, shoving his uh, kingside pawn shield forward. Uh, but again, uh, this is a chaotic situation. There are there are ideas in the position. There is uh, moves like rook d3 to be considered. Uh, l l just let me just throw right. this. So you're this mentioning one the in. one weakness being like perhaps that e3 and f3 squares, which are tiny bit tender. You can take right. advantage of them with rook d3. Right, and I'm just I'm just uh, throwing out a rather forcing looking line where black could you know uh, force a, a great number of, of trades and exchanges in the position, and somehow you know stagger to. A playable end end game position. How'd you get to that again? So after that was rook, rook d3. d3. I just I just played well because rook d3 does attack knight. Attacks that okay. Yeah, I was thinking knight takes c4. But I could also um, let's see. Can I consider taking the pawn on h6 instead? Ooh, a little bit dangerous. This guy sitting on d3 might might scare you. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I know you get to take on f3. I sure. don't know if this is scary or not. Uh, there's a bishop c5 check, there's a queen a7 check. Um, yeah, things are opening up a little bit for me for sure. Right. You would want to be absolutely certain that you haven't entered into a, a, a trap of sorts in this situation. Yeah. So that was why I just tossed out knight. Bishop takes h6, you got to consider, of course. All captures you should consider. So knight takes c4, I just kind of tossed that out. And I was thinking that in case of all of this four sequence of trades. Can we interpolate trade, a knight b6 somewhere? Because uh, um, when I take on c8, I'm attacking e7. I guess you might have queen a7 here, which uh, creates a. Uh, well, it's a good idea, I a think. panic, because after knight c8, or at least queen takes e3 is in the position. Right. But at least I've misplaced your queen. And you've won a pawn. So there is knight b6 to be considered. I did not look at that. I was just looking at the just straightforward captures. By the way, after captures, well, because you, because you can't. Well, I think the point is that after knight b6, queen b7, keeping an eye on the e4 pawn. Now uh, then it, the rook is then the rook on c8, and then we also get to take on e7 with check after right. takes on g2. Exactly. So we end up uh, coming out ahead in that. Oh, actually, it's kind of prettier to play queen takes c6 in that line, isn't it? Sorry, I'm not following. Oh, the I'm jam. saying if queen b7 here. Can we look at that line just for fun? Sure. And now after knight takes c8, if pawn takes g2, it's a, a prettier to, to play this way. <laughs> and, <laughs> love, better, and stronger. Love, and stronger love those time. royal forks, we don't we? Yeah. yeah. You see the moves. You want to show Look those royal forks. Maurice wants you to show queen takes c6, knight takes e 7 check. Because every time we can get a royal fork on the board, it's an accomplishment. Just like all those knight mates and right, pawn mates. Right, right. Do your push-ups. So this would, of course, be a, a winning uh, line of play for. I think we're doing too many push-ups. I think then we need to add some squats in there. You know, the legs are important too. So mm -hmm. knight forks equal squats. Okay. How many we got to do on the knight? A royal knight fork. Twenty. Twenty. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> okay. So rook d three may not be the only move, of course, but. Uh, oh, and it hasn't been played. Instead, uh, g takes f3 was played. and G takes f3, so very with, good. So with this game getting extremely exciting. So bishop takes f3 box. Um, uh, OK, yeah, it hasn't been, hasn't been played yet. So you're referring to informant notation in which a box means that a move is forced. Right. In the uh, 1960s and 70s, uh, a chess publication from Yugoslavia called The Chess Informant was published uh, biannually. And instead of writing notation in, in words, they used uh, symbols. And one symbol they created was a square. And when you saw a move and a notation of a square was attached to that move, it meant forced move. That move is a forced move. 
and instead of calling it a square move, we call it box. So this move uh, takes on f3, takes on, recaptures with the bishop is box. Why do we say it's box? Because if we've taken with the knight, then after bishop takes e4, comes with a tempo against queen and knight. So bishop takes f3 would be box or forced and white, uh, pardon me, black to play again. All right, you know, well, we are going to see how this game uh, shakes up. Uh, I will thank our many uh, Twitter followers and questioners here. We actually, at the hashtag US Chess Champs, have links for you to both that Nakamura game and also, I believe, the uh, Kasparov game as well. So Wonderful. plenty for you to do on the break in addition to solving a Fisher puzzle. So two games to analyze and a Fisher puzzle. And don't forget to get something to eat and a coffee for what's bound to be a really thrilling time control session here at the U.S. Chess Championships. Who knows, in just a couple hours, we may likely have two new champions there. So don't go away. We'll be right back at the U.S. Chess Championships.
guys. I hope you did all your homework uh, this break. We've got Grandmaster Maurice Sassy for the first part of that, that Fisher position versus Vladimir Tukmakov. Well, 50 lashes for you if you didn't find the move. Bishop to G4 in this position. Definitely the key move here. As we can see, this move, Bishop to G4, attacking the queen through to the knight, through to the rook. That's what you dream about in chess. Your opponent lining up his pieces so sweetly and nicely so that you can attack them all with only one of your pieces. The game continued queen to f6, and then simply d takes on e5, and there's that rook uncovering an attack on the knight. The bishop is also attacking the knight, and uh, what can you do? Your queen's under attack. Tukmakov played the move knight takes on e5 and dropped an exchange, and after rook takes on c8, Rook to d5, and now it's the other lineup this way. Look at all those black uh, pieces lined up on the same diagonal and the big old threat of simply taking this knight. The worst part is if you play the move bishop to d6, you run into the move knight takes b6, and there's a rook lined up with your queen, so your pawn's pinned. So this position is just terrible. Tukmakov decided it was time to throw in the towel. So that's how Bobby Fischer won this game. I'm sure you saw all that. Guys? Things are really heating up in the championship. Yeah, I know. We've we gone know. from push-ups to squats to lashes. <laughs> I mean, wow. that's kind of a progression. <laughs> wow. Not pain, so sure about pain. that. But check out the action that's going on in Victoria Knee versus Arena Crush. Whoa, first Obviously, glance. Uh, Arena's up a piece. Yes, indeed. Victoria to move. Let's see how this unfolded well, a few years ago. Well, she better be able ago. to play... G4 or queen takes G5 successfully, or Irina's going to be in the new champ, maybe. Precisely. So we were at this position, and Victoria uh, essayed the move rook F1. She didn't castle. She played rook F1, keeping her king in the center, um, obviously attacking the pawn on F6. E4, E3 was played by Irina. The knight captured on E3. Bishop came out here uh, to A6 eyeballing this pawn on d3, connecting her rooks. Still victorious, king is still in the center. Knight g4, knight f5, and knight takes f6. So this sacrifice had been prepared well in advance by Victoria. She's hoping that after rook takes f6, g3, g4, she'll not only win back her piece, but also in certain variations be able to play the move queen takes g5. Or I think it's an overreach, however, by Victoria. Well, queen takes g5 immediately is also a candidate. Queen takes g5 immediately. Uh, let me just go back one Although, move. Although, it looked like Victoria just played a move, so. Uh, queen takes g5 does uh, threaten the rook, but if the rook drops back, uh, Jen, did you have a specific idea for a follow-up? Right now, it's a whole piece. Yeah, I guess that's not hot enough, huh? Just after g4 now, where do you, you can just put your knight to d6. Huh? Knight d6, knight yeah, g3, knight d6. Um, lots of moves actually here for. Well, you but, have to okay. be a little careful because. Uh, of uh, my king. That, uh, 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 oh, but there because is. Because rook takes f7 here. And, and then, then c6 queen, is hanging. Well, yeah, and if knight takes queen f6 is hanging, right? Very good. Uh, counter attack for black, but white can bail out with moves like queen g7 check. Um, so that's not. The winning. But so that's not what Victoria did. She chose to keep the move queen takes g5 in reserve instead. I was also looking at, of course, after queen takes g5, rook takes h6 falls to rook takes f5. So Right. That's a nice little tactic. I'll like to show that to our audience. The rook on h6 would be, I mean, it, it makes a strange impression. White's king still in the center, but this looks favorable for white. Let's just go back. So instead of though, Victoria played g4 immediately and now... Which I think was her idea all, uh, along. all along. When she played the whole rook f1, she pers you know, she had this uh, position uh, mental in her mental uh, eye uh, expecting that she'll be able to win back the piece. But there there are some really <laughs> a lot of dangers in the position. I mean, even Indeed, kind of for both sides, but well, yeah, her, her pieces uh, don't look good. I'm just saying, I, if, if uh, Arena were to play a move like Rook E8, hoping to expose White's king, uh, White may end up having to try to tuck her king into this corner. Well, that doesn't look very pleasant, but let me ask you, if after Rook E8, what if you play queen takes g5 instead here? Yeah, I think it's just uh, 
that's the move uh, that's even better. That we need to at least get a pawn for our troubles. Otherwise, right. our king being s snagged in the center is going to be very unpleasant. And, and we've got some thoughts here from uh, Maurice. Well, it looks like the engines don't appreciate this sacrifice on F6. It seems as though the position was equal before that, but now black is the one for choice. She just has to find one move after the sacrifice on F6 and G4 has she played. It seems as though the solid rook to G8 guarding this pawn. Look, we've been talking about that variation the whole time. Grab the pawn, grab the pawn. Okay, no pawn for you. Now that pawn is covered and in this position taking the knight, then simply just pawn takes back. And now you look at it, black is the one with two pass pawns naturally this pawn is in the way so that does help shield black's king somewhat and it's not so easy to untangle what's happening here especially with white's king still in the middle of the board and it just seems like it just takes one move rook to g8 the trade on f5 and you look at the board and it just looks good for black like what is white doing exactly and it looks good really fast there's no secondary variations it just looks like it's arena for choice here so i think that victoria definitely overreached and now she's in some trouble, and if the Grandmaster can keep this position solid, she's going to be well on her way to uh, potentially tying for first, if not winning the whole thing. Guy? Right, because meanwhile, we should take a look at Anna Zatonsky's game. And I'll bring that up. And, yep. <clears throat> well. And it looks like Anna has played the move King E2. She's hoping perhaps to trade queens where that king on E2 will actually be better placed than if you were to castle. And she actually did follow that up with... Um, after rook to c8, rook on a to c8 in this mm -hmm. position, yep. she played queen to c6. So she does want to trade queens, but Katarina said no, play queen a6 check instead. And now on a renewing the, the queen trade. Offer with queen c4. Queen c4. So a repetition at the moment and after queen b6. And now has the option, of course, to play queen d7, but I think uh, Zatonsky certainly can't risk that. There's. Even if she doesn't like her position, she must keep playing. It would be absolutely insane for her to take a draw. It's just not going to happen. Exactly. It's just not going to happen. And Anna is w one of the most fighting players out there. She'll, she knows that. So I, the question is where she's going to differ, I guess, after queen b7. Because the problem is with her king there on e2, if uh, Nemkova gets the move c5 in, it could start looking real ugly for her. But you mm. know what? I really think she's still going to have to, like, She's going to have to try to weather the storm. Maybe she'll play the move B4, but she can't repeat. She cannot no, repeat. No, no. Oh, for, for, for sure she will play on. No ifs, ands, or buts about that. Uh, queen B7, expected move. There is this move B4. With the idea that now C5, at least we're holding it back because we can try to snag a pawn, although even there we have to worry about the possible tactics with potential queen b2 check coming into the position. Right. I was thinking that uh, maybe queen a4, uh, challenging black, pretty much provoking the move c5. I'm not 100% sure that there's a choice, an alternative. I don't like my king, obviously, uh, still in the center with this rook on h1. I want to bring my rook to d1. And, but after c5, there are ideas like simply bishop d6 or bishop e5. So, for example, if we take, probably you're going to recapture with the rook. Not 100% sure, but if you recapture with the pawn, the idea really was to play bishop e5, covering, whoops, that was a terrible arrow, covering the b2 pawn and trying to uh, complete the development. So, Anna. Um, will have split her pawns, uh, her opponent's pawns. We've seen these split pawns in numerous games in right. this U.S. championship. Her it's loss against Irina Crush, so she'll have unpleasant memories of being on the other end of this. But <laughs> of course, when I was playing C5, that your, your queen was on the C5. Of so course. I was getting but you've my, got to play my major into the game. Well, you've got to play C5 anyway. Otherwise, if white, you, you simply cannot uh, suffer a knight uh, coming to C6. So you're going to end up Eventually having to play C5. To play and you're saying it's going to be impossible to play it and be able to capture with a piece. What if we play, um, what if we play for knight e4 in this position? Okay, so knight e4, great. So you just give me the, the chance to quickly get in my 
So you're saying great for you, not great for me. Well, yeah, no, well, <laughs> just that uh, great, great for White that she could finally uh, develop her rook. Now, in now this case, C5, five, right. So now, now my idea is that I'd like to take with the knight. Right, so that you could recapture with the knight, precisely. So I don't know, for example, a move like knight e5 here uh, for White. If you take, I'm, I'm still hoping that one day I may be able to conquer the c6 square, uh, plant my knight on the c6 square. You could ta definitely take my bishop on g3. I think black is going to be happy in all of these cases just because the king on e2 just feels wrong. This whole line of play for white just doesn't make a yeah, good impression. Yeah, we might even be able to do things like take on g3 and play b5, c4, and try to play for c3 and b4. And to keep your knight on d5. Yeah, yeah. that looks... So, so this uh, looks uh, fine for Nemkova, but mm -hmm. I still... You got to play. You got. You're not going to make a repetition. That's, that's, that's and out both, of the question. Both players are not a ton of time. 18 moves. Oh my to make. gosh! I think we've just <gasps> seen a repetition again. Just one time though. There's just no one time. way. It would be so insane for her to do that. By the way, there's one other line I here just, for White that I. I actually I, guess because I just it just it just scares you to think that like she might have just lost her mind. No. Because how many more times can she do it without it being? Okay, just a second. Let me get out of the way. After <laughs> Queen A6, how about the move Rook C4? So you okay. think she's just trying to switch around and and after Queen A6 check, gain time the on the C4. clock. Let's say. Let's just say Remember gaining time on. Remember somebody did that and they almost gave up a draw because of it. Remember that was the Ashrika game, Aswaran. Right. Where she uh, actually accidentally allowed a three-move repetition. Yeah. There, right. there, there could have been a claim by Camilla. Um, or that was, was it? That was a uh, Sabina Voivier, I believe. Uh, Sabina yeah. could have made a claim. But that hasn't happened yet, right? Because Queen C6 was played in the board on move 21. Mm -hmm. That's instance number one. Mm -hmm. And this is instance number two. Okay. So, so and I, the queen, when it, when it came to C6, it was on C4. Mm -hmm. So, therefore, she must deviate now. Right. So, so she cannot play Queen C4 now, because then right. Queen B7 would be a claim. Uh, yes. with claim. I believe so, so. I can double check that, but yeah. So rook c4 for sure is what... Now, this is also the thing is why Why does Anna think now? Because she knows that if she plays the move queen c4, uh, a draw uh, can be agreed. But rook c4 keeps the game alive. Um, Unless she miscounted or something and now she's realizing. Miscounted? <laughs> miscounted? How do you miscount? <laughs> it happens. It happens. But let's move over to board one. We've got some action in the Lenderman Agovian. Okay, so after F3, let's go back just a move or got two. Got some action and we got massive trades. Bishop E3, F3 takes, Bishop takes F3, H5. Wow, H5. Rook C1, Bishop B7. These moves have all been played. And the move h5, really, I find that stunning. Um, my when, goodness. When you say stunning, you mean bad, don't you? Uh, <laughs> surprising, stunning. Yeah, mostly it, it has means a negative, bad. It has surprising, a negative surprising is surprising. Stunning is surprisingly With bad. With a slightly negative <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's kind of like the opposite. Usually, yeah. most people, when they say stunning, it's like, beautiful. Yeah, stunningly <laughs> beautiful. Uh, so <laughs> h5. Opened up Black's king a bit, but still uh, Bishop b7, stepping back, not allowing just uh, Queen takes c4, and... We should hate on h5 some more, so Nakamura sends us some more games. <laughs> <laughs> I, this is when I played h5. This is where I won a wonderful game <laughs> against uh, Alexander Grishuk. Check out. Okay. So now we've got to come up with a good move for white here, Jen. Let's put on our thinking caps. Well, you know there's been many moves since then. Oh, I don't know. No. I thought I was up to date. I apologize. No, not even close. Okay. We've got another six moves that have been played, actually. Okay, after bishop um, b7, walk... A massive walk, forcing line kind of has occurred on the board. Walk me through the moves after well, bishop b7. Well, after bishop to b7, uh, the move... After h5, rook ac1, bishop b7, we saw knight takes c4 on the board. Okay. And then rook takes v1, rook okay. takes v1, bishop takes e4. okay. And then after bishop takes e4, queen takes e4. Getting the very ending that we queen looked at. Queen takes e4, knight takes e4, and b3. And this is our current position on the board. Now they've only got 10 moves left to make in time control. Var with 12 minutes on his clock, and Lenderman with 23. I think Var is well on his way to cruising to a draw here. I don't see issues for him 
at this moment. So you don't. So if you had to pick a side here, what would you pick? You'd still rather be white. No. You you would rather be black. No. Wait. I think so it's if just, I just had a draw to, zero zero zero. If I had to choose black. If you had to choose, you would pick black. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because now uh, I don't see these pawns on B3 uh, and A2 as being that great, whereas I kind of think, it, it, okay, on a very good day, it's going to need a very good day, but I kind of think that the pawn on E6, which is already passed, has more potential than um, what's happening on the queen side. All right, well, if there is a draw in this game... <laughs> Maurice Ashley has some thoughts on and scenarios for us and all of the wild possibilities that are in store for us tomorrow in a playoff. Remember, we're guaranteed a playoff if this game is drawn. Indeed, if these two players draw, then minimally they will have to come back tomorrow and play each other. But in fact, if they draw, maximally it would be the same thing. So here's what could happen. For as far as Komsky is concerned, he wants to see this draw badly. Why? Because Akobian and Lindemann would have to go into an Armageddon match. Neither one wants to do that. And, and after fighting it out to the death, the winner has to sit and, and go play Komsky. I mean, that's got to be a headache. That's got to be a mess. Komsky, of course, would be thrilled. He would have caught these two players uh, right at the tape and have the chance to watch them tire themselves out with the winner hopefully not bloodied, certainly not beaten, having to face him. That would be all Komsky there. I think everybody would be picking a Komsky victory. So unfortunately for these two players, it looks like they, the first half of that scenario is leading that way. A trade has happened. The body language of Akobian has shifted completely. He's looking much more relaxed right now like, I solved all the problems, I'm okay, this position, if I play correctly, should be a draw. This is kind of easy peasy for him. It's really looking like this game is going towards uh, creating a playoff for us guys tomorrow. No rest for the weary. We thought we might have had some time off. No way in the world. This really looks like it's going to be playoff territory. Look on the right side, Maurice. More chicken wings from Lester's. More chicken wings from Lester's. Okay, okay. I I guess I'll come to work for that. <laughs> well, there's work and there's really, really fun work. Uh, it, it, I think it would be great. I like the playoffs. I it, Dramatic. I like it when the players uh, have their destinies in their hands and it's not decided by other players on other boards. So I like... Uh, the playoff scenario. By the way, let's take a quick look at the ga game of Gata Kamsky. That's right. Yes, because that game is looking <clears throat> to be more and more relevant. I really thought that uh, uh, the chances were our, our board one was going to be decisive, but maybe not. Quite some moves ago, I was saying that the thing I liked about Gata's position was that, you know, uh, you, uh, just a moment before, pardon me, that there were these bishop sacrifices in the position. Uh, premature at this exact moment, but I saw that the queen could come up to h5. The, there's going to be a rover in the, on, along the e-file, knight coming to f3. I saw Gata being able to build up an attack for free, if you will, on the king side. And, and amazingly enough, that's exactly what the, what's occurred. After a5, rook e3, the rover, queen coming out to g4. And look at this, black, white's pieces are just everything. It's like uh, a USC uh, college football game, student body right. Everything's going over uh, to Blacks. Uh, Josh is king, and Josh is seizing the defensive yeah, he's playing with Bishop, Bishop E8. And he's going to try to play F5, and then, you know, bring or that F6. bishop into the defense, right? Right. And F6 bring or, yeah, F5 would have uh, blocked the bishop on C2. F6 looks more solid. So. And I was looking at a crazy line where white sacrificing pieces galore, but guess what? Um, this piece sacrifice might be uh, a winner. So shall I show that one again for Gata Kamsky? So I'm just looking at this move, knight g5. Of course, bishop takes g5, queen takes g5, f7, f6 is my oversight. <laughs> I, I just wanted to... No uh, chicken wings for you. No chicken wings Extra for me. I was, I was just trying to sacrifice all of Goddess pieces brilliantly. I su succeeded in one line, 
but in the main move uh, doesn't work. Okay, so Gata has to come up with something in this exact moment now. Well, we have we do have a couple more moves. That's your bishop e8, um, the move what? bishop, just a simple move. <laughs> what bishop h2. Bishop h2. And now uh, Josh H2? played f5. f7, so, f5. So very weakening, but also, blunting uh, both the queen and the bishop to that. Okay, so knight g5 looks like a standard move here. I, no, interestingly, Gata, you don't see this that often. Gata is actually down to 10 minutes with 14 moves to go. Josh Riddell with 16 minutes. So with uh, a lot more juice in the position than wow. in, some of, in the, our Verusian uh, Lenderman game, this time could actually become more of an issue than the game we thought time would become a critical factor. Right, we were all looking at Var's clock, and now maybe we should be looking at Kamsky's and Josh's clock. Exactly. But I'm looking at So now you're looking at the move knight to g5. g5. Bishop takes g5, queen takes g5. h6 does lure the white queen into a discovered, a discovered attack, but the knight really doesn't have that many good squares, and the queen's dropping back to e2. I like goddess can got his position in this variation. Well, yes, that uh, pawn on uh, e6 looks really weak, so we're gonna have to, you're going to have to try to defend it passively at some point with the move bishop f7 or bishop d7. And right. That doesn't look too pretty. Bishop d7 even allows the possibility at some moment to play bishop a4 and perhaps remove the defender. And keep in mind, you got to keep con uh, you got to keep g6 protected as well. The knight on g6 needs protection, so the bishop can't get too frisky on e8. So Gata for choice, and again... Yes, indeed, and we've got Maurice Ashley for some news on knee crush. It looks like uh, Irina has played the move rook to e8 earlier, but what's going on now? Well, it looks as though Irina is just in the driver's seat now. Reason, biggest reason, is the clock. It looks as though knee is in serious time pressure. She Remember, she was ahead at one point, but it's 13 moves to go. She has three and a half minutes left and counting, at least on my clock here, with those 13 moves, she'll get back about six and a half minutes, but still, that's a lot of time to play a worse position at that. She did play after G4. Irina did find the move, rook to G8, and knee threw out the move, H7, attacking the rook. You didn't want to take this pawn, even if it was a good idea. She played the move rook to e8. Well, obviously it was a great idea, and you could see it all, but this was a very practical decision. Let the pawn stand in the way and protect your king, and now the move rook to e8 has been played, and now black is just in danger after queen takes g5, the move rook to f7, and you're down a piece for what? For, for nothing, actually. This knight, capturing this knight, would lead to simply e takes f5 check, the king is just wide open. You thought it was white attacking. Now it's black attacking. So it looks as though Irina Crush has the position completely under control. Up material on the board, up on time. And you can see how relaxed she is now. She's just comfortably getting in. And our king has had to move from Victoria Knee. She knows she has collapsed now. Her position in deep trouble. All Crush has to do is put together five or six good moves. And seven points is hers. On the other side of the women's battle. This one, the move was played rook to c4. She did not repeat. Anna Zatonski knows she has to win this game. She might as well lose the game as far as she's concerned. She's only used to winning championships, not limping to a draw. So she played rook c4, and then after knight e4, she's played this move rook to d8. This move looks like a, a blunder, actually, because of knight to d6 attacking the rook. However, she does have the move queen to a4, just saving herself right on time and if queen back threatening forks in the rook then just move the rook down and she's okay so definitely a lot of time a lot of game left but not a lot of time she has to make 15 moves in seven and a half minutes <laughs> man okay we got the increments again but talk about excitement here at the championships anna is going to have to press hard she wants to win this game so she can go into a playoffs with her main rival irena crush who looks like she's cruising to victory Guys? Wow. That's uh, right. Well, <laughs> big, big, big games. Now, me on. and meanwhile, Lenderman Akobian looks like it will get a handshake in that game pretty soon. So let's I was a little bit confused by the Zatonsky situation. Can sure. you take a look at that? Absolutely. That move knight d6. Let's uh, show that a little bit slower. So knight okay. d six, I think the first point is that it's a very forcey move because So the idea of knight d six is you attack the rook. You can't take the knight 
and think that you're giving up your queen for two rooks because it, there's a pin. There's a very unfortunate pin. So that would be losing. That was why Marie said after the move knight d6. Only move or box move as you like to say. Right. Queen a4 here. Queen a4. So taking advantage of the fact that the queen on a6 is unprotected to tactically defend uh, that rook on c4. Precisely. And now queen b7 uh, brings the threat of b5 into the position. As well as knight takes c4. <laughs> and then, Simple moves. And then rook c6 and was what Maurice was saying. So now after rook c6, uh, uh, what about, how does the position look after b5 in this position? Well, suddenly, you know. I guess know, we can play queen, a, it's a problem we can play queen a6, huh? Precisely. Because I was thinking that if queen c2, knight c4 might be a good move. Okay. Uh, the problem from black's point of view, if she is not permitted the opportunity of playing c7, c5, white is going to get a very powerful strategic bind on the queen side, go going to play knight f3 to e5. So the move b5 to try to uh, block the coordination of the rooks and queens makes sense, except that queen a6 is a very powerful retort. And after this, uh, Anna. Uh, regardless of her time, is in the driver's seat. I would expect her to win this so, position. So hands you're saying down. don't make a bunch of holes in my position on c5 <sighs> and a5, and we can my b pawn all at the same time. Yeah, something along. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, that's it. That's it. So you're right. So b5 causes you to cringe. By the way, the moves knight d6, queen a4 have appeared on the board. Have indeed appeared on the board. Okay, so knight d6, queen uh, a4. If the queens come off, again, very favorable for Anna, who happens to be lower on time. And at the moment, the pawn on a7 is hanging, so that in case of a5, well, this might give Anna just the timing that she needs to post up her knight on the c6 square and get a great game. Uh, frankly speaking, close to a, a strategic win, winning position, in my view, if she could ever achieve that. So uh, Nemkova in trouble, and how quickly that occurred. It seemed that uh, Katya was, was playing very sound, solid chess. Uh, White had some issues with her king on e2 and her rook on h1. Solved those issues, and now I really like Anna's position. All right, so you feel like that move king e2 now is proving not to be so ugly after it's all. It's worked out. We were liking the positions, I think, just logically speaking. Obviously, if we can keep queens on the board with the king on e2, we would really prefer that for black, but it seems that Anna Zatonsky has figured out a way to make that impossible. Exactly. And again, if she's able to trade queens instead of the king being a liability on e2, it's actually perfect, wonderful, right there in the center of the board, uh, ready to play even moves like king d3 and e4, uh, supporting uh, pawn advance. So big advantage suddenly for Anna Zatonsky as well. All right, well... And Maurice, you've got something to share with us, too. Yes, actually, there's a sneaky idea in this position, Yaz, that uh, might be overlooked. Check this out. The move you talked about, queen a4, the queen dropping back to b7, the move rook to c6, looking like it's taking up a dominating position. Well, this knight, that's the problem, could move to the f5 square suddenly, and the point here is it's headed to the e7 square. And if it gets here, it will eject the rook from the position, and it won't be as bad as everything seemed a moment ago. White is still somewhat better, obviously, in this position. White could save the bishop here, and now knight back to e7, the rook having to drop back, let's say, to c2. And now the move c5 suddenly. And this changes the character of the game dramatically. If you take, take, and try to win a pawn here on the c5 square, well, the move f6, and suddenly your bishop is weird. This pawn comes under attack very easily, and black is aiming to win that pawn back. So some complication still. It's not that obvious, and who says that she, her opponent is going to find all these moves? Uh, this, this is some complicated computer stuff being generated here. But I do want to show another one that's not complicated that we would all love to have is this position between knee and crush. This position is just a dominating position for black. White is in severe time pressure, by the way. Look what happened here. After the move, rook to e8, she took on g5, rook f7. She now decided she didn't want to take on f5 because rook g7 might have created a problem along this line in addition to the pawn capture. So she took her bishop takes knight first. You get the feeling like she's giving up now, like giving away some of her trumps, doesn't having to trade. And after takes, takes, 
discover check on her king. She had to play king to d2. Whose king is safer? Well, after you see the move rook to g7, you start to understand whose king is safer. Look at this problem that's seemingly about to land on the chessboard. A problem indeed for, for white. This knight on c1, this rook on a1, they leave a horrible impression. What's going to happen to this king? We have rooks. We have a queen thinking about g2. Bishop eyeballing the pawn. It looks as though Irina Crush is going to roll her way to seven points. And the time situation is really bad for white as well. So everything going in the grandmaster's favor. Guys? That's Thank right. You, so Marie's, Irina Crush's uh, position looking quite nice. And just three minutes on knees clock. Help me out a bit, Maurice, because I didn't see it myself. After the move, king d2, rook g7, queen takes f5. What's the bone cruncher that I'm missing? The bone cruncher, yeah, the, the, the super unusual move is bishop back to c8, bringing I'm... the bishop into the game before you get a chance to move this piece. And uh, there's some really nice lines. Check this out. If you play the move queen to f4, okay. rook down with check. Yep. Rook f2, box. Rook to f2, looks like only move. And now how's this for a sick move? Bam! <laughs> like what? <laughs> What'd you do that for? <laughs> Give me that, and you got problems. Your king is stuck. If you play the only king move, the bishop seeks revenge, and your position is going to be toast any second. Nasty line. Obviously, you could play knight blocks, and then just this rook takes, and <laughs> Help, two rooks on the seventh. Disco's threatened everywhere. It's going to be mate. So Beautiful. bishop to c8, queen f4, rook g2, rook f2. That's an easy move to miss for white. And the threat is queen takes queen. What are you supposed to do with your position? The position is just terrible. Again, queen takes queen, rook takes. Uh, knight blocks is a line we've seen before after takes. The king still has to go here. And then bishop to g4. So, whew. That would be nasty. That now, again, Irina has to find all these moves as well. So right. there's, no, there's no guarantee she's going to play these kind of scintillating ideas. But she knows for sure, for a fact, and she's going to spend some time looking at it, she must be winning. This position is just too good. So what to do to really put the nail in the coffin? She's exploring that right now, studying. Now, the one thing I would say is that Irina tends to not be a super-duper attacking player. That's not her style. That's not what she looks for, is big sacrifices in order to win games. But she is a GMF, GM after all. She will find moves. But you could tell she's studying, and she knows knockout punch right now. That's what she's thinking. Must be something really wrong. How do I increase this dramatically so that I can win the game? And that line hiding in the, in the variations is something that she might miss trying to do all these calculations at the moment because she has to sacrifice the pawn uh, in this position in order to make it happen. But there was two gems there, real, real beauties. First of all, the misdirection move, bishop a6 to c8, the bishop on a6, tacking the pawn on d3, suddenly comes around to the mm -hmm. other side of the board, giving a decisive check on g4. But that queen h6, Very that pretty. was stunning. Queen h6 was a beautiful, stunning, stunning hey, move. Stunning, but not even sarcastic. In a, in a positive sense. And wow, that what a way to... Uh, that would be a great way to, 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 to win, win the playoffs. Oh, yeah. Wow. That or would to win the, the playoffs, because yeah. if Anna does win, it doesn't necessarily worthy. win the women's championship. True. Yes, to win the playoff. But yeah. Anna still has a lot more work to do. We, of course, of course. But uh, nice, nice variations, great attacking variations. But it's what, hard to imagine that's the only good thing for Black to do either. There's got to be some other ways I'm for Black sure. to have a good position I, here with the, with this overwhelmingly uh, ugly king on b2. Well, let's just... Uh, In fact, she did not play uh, that move. Instead, she has just made a move. She played queen to e6. Oops. And uh, let's let's take a look and see. Uh, Gata Kamsky's game against Josh okay. Friedel, a couple of moves have been played, including a committal one by Josh Friedel. He uh, has pushed his pawn further to f4 in this position, and... Um, Maurice has something to share. Yeah, just a big alert. The move queen to e6 is a really bad move. Really, really bad move. She overlooked a possibility here. Not that it's losing by any stretch, but she's changed the nature of the position. She's thrown away a big part of her advantage because rook g1 threatens queen to g8. And how do you deal with this move queen to g8? Just trading off and going into 
more drawn position than before. Well, first of all, the threat is, is a big threat. If you make a move like Rook to D7, if you don't want to take this pawn, then the position could change. I believe she could just play Queen G8 here and allow this trade to happen. Maybe it's not all that bad, but this is much, much closer to a draw. This pawn is not that strong, much closer to a draw than the other position. A matter of fact, after A4, threatening the move A5, if you have to block this diagonal, this king will be able to sneak this way, and this pawn's not going anywhere. So rook, rook to the move queen E6 may have thrown away a big part of her advantage if the move rook G1 lands on the board. Now, there is a way to try to maintain rook something with this move, move, rook takes. And after rook to g2, she has to find these two moves. Now her king is threatening to sneak this way, and it's not so easy to penetrate. So Irina Crush might have made the one move that threw away her advantage, or at least a big part of her advantage, and that win that we saw, that easy cruise, is not the case anymore if, his oppo if her opponent finds that move. Guys? Well, that, I mean, probably Irina just thought that after rook g1, which did happen, by the way, she must think that after rook takes h7, rook g2, there's a lot of possibilities with queen to e1 check, and... Again, it looks attractive to Black. You can see how she would think that that position offers her a lot of rich possibilities, especially with me under pressure. So it's, it, it's very easy to play uh, these positions as Black, believing that your advantage is great. However, as Maurice points out, <coughs> if, White, if White ever solves the issue of her king, uh, after moves like rook g2 and king c2, she's right back in the game, no problem, because that f pawn, and by the way, as long as that pawn on h7 was on the board, um, uh, Arena's king was safe. Now that it's been captured, her king's been exposed. She, she has, has a, played she queen has f4, a, by the way. Instead of playing rook to g, yeah, she's played queen to f4. She did not play uh, rook, the, rook g2, which. By the way, this is an easy move for white to want to play as well. Queen f4 looks pretty nice. After all, you do cover the h2 square, you blockade the pawn. Uh, the strength of, you know, the purposefulness of rook g2 over queen f4 was, was not obvious. So this move, queen f4, I can't criticize. It looks like a decent move. It's not as good a move technically, but it's not losing. It's just a slight edge for black. It's significant enough edge. White still has to resolve the issue of her knight on c1 and rook on a1, so it's definitely still an edge. But the computer is saying, nope, uh, I think uh, this is tenable. This is something that you can hold. It's giving the move c4 in this position as the number one move, which is a surprise to my eyes. But still, it looks as though Irina now will have to buckle down and figure out what's the right continuation. All the squares are covered. So. She does, but man, this position is not easy to play for White with two minutes on the clock. I mean, it's really hard for me to believe Knee is going to hold this for eight more moves. I think it's going to be very tough for her. Without question, it'll be tough for anybody. Yeah. But in this position, it just doesn't help when with, you have two minutes to... Hopefully, she, I mean, she's going to have to try to find it. Because it, like, it's, it's hard because a lot of the moves that she might consider weaken her position, right? Mm -hmm. So it would be good for her if she was able to find this idea of rook g2, also menacing at rook e2 and king c2. Mm -hmm. Um, and in fact, Irina has played rook to h3 in this position, and now knee is on move again with less than two minutes, well, less than two and a half minutes on her clock. So rook to h3. Position, yeah, is, I'm in c4 for white, so oh, black, black could not play c4, so I didn't realize it was black on move. Right. Black could not play c4 because if you drop back one move yep. uh, in your analysis diagram, yep. the move c4 uh, now allows the move queen to d4 with check. I see. And, right. and let's, put, let's, no, a queen. let's put that on the board. Queen d4 with check, which doesn't just force the trade of queens because after queen e5, suddenly rook to oh, e1, gross. oops, yeah. and you're done. <laughs> so yeah. she didn't, she <laughs> didn't fall for that move because obviously the intermezzo rook takes rook check would happen here. Even rook h2 check doesn't help because the king moves back. So definitely no c4 in the menu for black, black. in this position. I see. Sorry. Thank so instead, Irina point. played rook to h3, perhaps threatening. Um, captures on d3, followed by queen to e2 check. Mm -hmm. So that that seems to be the direct threat here. And that's why we're, we're that's where Maurice was saying that c4 just to block the bishop. Uh, yeah, it was c4 to block the bishop and so maybe to maybe to put a hiding place for the king. Uh, if you can get a knight b3 and king c3, you're still king. Uh, king. Very much so. By the way, again, uh, look at. Whoa! The wait a second. Victoria and E just played king to c2. Doesn't that just let's Whoa. see now? How does 
how does that deal with bishop takes d3, knight d3, queen d2 check? Well, oh, there's a queen d2 sneaking back in. Bishop takes d3, knight takes d3, rook takes d3, did you say? Well, uh, there's... Well, couple, again, I guess rook, uh, rook d3 allows queen h4. Yeah, check. J j just exact, a, j exact. J j and then queen e2, we can sneak. We can sneak in with uh, queen d2. But then you have. Well, yeah. just an alert, and I just want to you emphasize this. Huh? I want to emphasize this point. When white had a pawn on h7, black's king was really, really happy because that pawn was a great. A uh, shield for Black's King. Okay. Without that pawn on H7, every t anytime you play a move like Rook takes H3 in these types of positions, thinking that you're going to get a quick, sweet Queen E2 checkmate victory, well, before that happens, you may have to deal with a very exposed King on the King side after, for example, a move like Queen H6 checks. Oopsie daisy. So this is not play on one goal uh, by any means. And so king c2 is Bishop a reasonable move. Yeah, just knight d3, queen e2 check, queen d2 holds. No, there's no reason to play. Even in that position, uh, knight takes, queen to e2, you can move the king. Absolutely. You're king. You might, that you might think about maybe. <laughs> uh, you, uh, queen, takes, queen takes on d3 now, runs into something like rook to e1, rook a e1, thanks. Yeah. And you'll start thinking about perpetual really <laughs> fast. Right. And how do I save myself? <laughs> right. So this would be a, a unmitigated disaster so. for Irina to have allowed this. And she, by the way, according to the computer, she's no longer winning. She's just no longer winning. And all, actually, Bishop takes D3. What would be great about it is she will have solved a problem for for knight. Victoria. Mm -hmm. it, she, Victoria's trying to figure out how to develop the knight. <laughs> right. Oh, I can take a bishop. Thank goodness my rooks are connected. So bishop d3 would not be a wise choice in any event. At least try to prolong the game somewhat and have Victoria think through how to solve this problem of her knight sitting on the back row, which won't necessarily be able to move for a while, and the rook still has to get into the game. That's going to be the professional way to handle the position. Sure, keep the, keep the tension of the position when your opponent has less than a minute and a half. Just in analysis, we have to look at the forcing moves. Of course, of Just course. Just as Victoria, and that's what's difficult for Victoria, actually, that she's got to look at all of these moves constantly, any kind of check or capture or aggressive move, and she's only got a minute and 20 seconds. So. Regardless of what the computer says, I'm not feeling um, confident about Victoria's chances to play seven good moves here. It's going to be difficult for her. Seven good moves on the increment, unless the position really, the tension evaporates and she can make the moves easily. Um, so the, 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 the goal for Irina is how to keep the tension in the position, how to just make a strong move that, for, for, for instance, maybe threatens rook to h2 check or something like that. Is there any move we can make that connects us? Uh, to try to get your rook to h2 is going to be a big ask. Yeah. Uh, you, you almost have to play a move like queen e5, it's allowing a queen trade, which goes against what your advice is, is to keep the tension. So I don't see exactly yes. how she's going to keep yeah, the move. tension. A move like rook d8 fails to something like queen g5. And as you pointed out, um, play in play in both goals. Yes. Well, again, it's and rook, eight, rook h two is in the position, but meanwhile we're threatening queen <laughs> seven, eight, queen and, and the queen rook on d eight. Exactly. It's really messy. Right. Guys, uh, what's the time situation in the Zatonsky game? It looks as though they're under two minutes each. Wow. Let's switch over to that, uh, and um, we do have this move. B, three, B, four. Two minutes for Anna and uh, three and a half for Nemkova, but they've got 12 moves left to make. Knight so four. Victoria and E with uh, seven moves to make, and those those gals with even less done. Wow. So, by the way, with the move B2, B4 by Anna, Anna is doing her best to really clamp down on that C6 square. What she's really aspiring for is to be able to play the move B4, B5 when there's, gonna, there's never going to be a chance for. Uh, uh, for Nemkova to unravel her problem on this backward pawn on the C file. So even though the times are two minutes for Anna, two and a half uh, for Nemkova, Anna has got her positional grip 
grippers on the position. And yeah, I'm kind of less worried about it. Even though technically there's lot more moves to make with little time, mm -hmm. I think Victoria needs in the deepest pressure because her king situation seems so scary. That's such a scary position to play on the no, increment. I, I don't it's see an incredible line in this particular line? position. No. May I, may like I just exciting. quickly point sure, it please. out? What would you do after the move A5? Instinct. instinct B5. Yeah. B5 instantly and suddenly a queen sacrifice on C6 and you're losing. Ooh. Down an exchange, suddenly, rook takes, bam, check, and there goes your queen. How did that happen? Wow. How did that happen? Well, actually, maybe not fully losing in this position. It looks like there might be some chances to trap this knight, but that trick is definitely in the position. Now that I'm looking at it, it looks, actually, the more I look at it, the more it looks like this knight is trapped. But there's that trick in the position. Maybe she might even notice it. It turns out that, that the computer is saying black's slightly better here because this knight is trapped. So a weird line. Maybe you I chose the wrong knight. Yeah, right. Maybe I chose the wrong knight. Maybe here I should have chosen the other knight. Precisely. The other knight, Maurice. That's yeah, the a other sweet knight. trap. Where, where was I? 94. Uh, B5. B4 was played. And if the move, if the move A5, new variation, I got excited. I should have <laughs> simply chosen this knight yes. with check. And now it's over. No, queen no, takes you, c6. Queen takes c6 oh, sorry. Queen takes c6 first. Um, but uh, instead queen of b5, c6. maybe we could have played takes on a5. Of course. And but this keep, is the, just... uh, keep the queen connecting to the rock. Yes, but if you take on a5, uh, let's just point out that this knight should have been the one that went here with the winning position. But if you take on a5, it means you're trying to defend the position, right? a5, you're trying to defend here, keeping the queen connected. But what if rook a8? Rook a8? This is who's, uh, who's attacking who? No, uh, very good, Marie. Nice, nice little <coughs> tactic. I like that a lot. You know, actually, I think Nemkova must have seen a, a ghost of that idea because she played the move a6 uh, with the idea of perhaps playing b5. But then the Anna Zatonsky has back. has just dropped her rook back to c2. So after b4, a5. Nice shot by Marie. Not me. Sorry. Sorry. That, Sorry. Was, that was the engine. Let's get okay. back to it. A6 and. Uh, a little bit of a su surprise, uh, the rook on c6 that looked nicely posted up there has dropped back with rook c2. I would have thought, you know, you want to play knight e5. Knight e5 has a drawback, right? Well, because there might be another trap, too. I think maybe, like, something with knight c5 and b5 is also in the position. Maybe that's why Irina, I mean, sorry, Anna dropped her rook back to c2. Okay, I just After showed After a6. That. Uh, oh, because you can just take with a B pawn, and, and A6 is hanging. is hanging, yeah. Okay, guys, I just got uh, yeah. a, a quick variation. I want to play knight E5. Knight E5 has a drawback. After knight E5, knight takes G3, H takes G3, knight E7, rook comes back, queen takes G2. So to prepare my move knight E5, I would have, in Anna's shoes, I would have dropped back with the king. Play king f1 and then play knight e5. She didn't do that. Interesting, actually. In fact, Before, what she did is she put her rook back to c2, and now Katarina has lashed out with c5. Right. And just as the two players are in time pressure, I'm going to have to take back my words and say, like, wow, this one's also got to be a lot of pressure for both players. Just a minute left on the clock for Katarina and Koven, and a minute and a half for Anna Zitonsky, and now the position's blowing up. What did we say about D4 openings? Yeah, the battle, <laughs> the, the, the battle is delayed until later. But okay, so let's just take a quick look. Does this move C5 save black or put her, she jumps from the fire, from the pan into the fire. B takes C5, B takes C5, D takes C5, what do you do? What's uh, the follow-up for Nemkova? She and, has and played uh, B Anna takes C5. She has played B takes C5, indeed. As we so, see on the... what's the fault? I don't like White's king on E2. It would have been sweet and nice to have it back on F1. But for the moment, there is no knight C3 check because I can just take everything. Queen B2 check is harmless after either rook C2 or queen C2. So, knight C3 check is not what Nemkova has in mind. She has something else in mind. She did play B takes Whatever C5. It is. Whatever it is, is not sound because the engines are saying that this position is just better for white. Nothing mm -hmm. here, no tactics, not even a try. I'm trying to get inside her head. There right. are just no tactics that help her here. Uh, no simple tricks to get her out of this position. It looks as if she's just lost a pawn. And if white ever plays c5, c6, c7, that's just resigns because then your pawn up and it's super powerful pawn passer on c7 killing the position. So, so how Anna. do we attack e7? We basically, I mean, Katarina has to try to keep things interesting here because she's, both sides have less than two minutes. 
Although I mean, queen, how can she even make an attacking move? Although queen takes e4 is not a threat because of knight c3, discover and check. And just played knight, knight on d to c3 check. What? What is her idea? What? Rook I, takes c3. Oh, and now, queen b2 check is her yes, idea. Yes, queen b2 checks her idea. So now if the rook comes back to c2, there's knight c3 in the position. Right. And now, but the story's not over, is it? Because the, uh, oh, it is. So you wouldn't exchange if we move. If we move the king, you win an exchange, but how's your knight doing over there? And there's also a pawn. Not happy. The knight's got, still got the a4 square, so that's the one square the knight has, and there doesn't look like there's a way for us to block it. Well, we can sure. plug our bishop on d6. Right, bishop to d6, and knight to d4, and still, we got to have to solve this, but isn't there Wait, what about, sorry, king c3 there, yes? Back, and back, back, back. Oh, rook d6, I'm sorry. King yes. c3, rook d6, okay. Okay, but knight d4, all to play for. Let's just see the current position. I'm going to go uh, well, back and forth for a second. Rook c3 has been played, and now queen b2 check, and now it's Anna Zatonsky on move, and it mm -hmm. looks like she's just going to play rook c2, and she's kind of forced to try to find these variations, right? Well, there's no choice, right? Yeah. You have to play rook c2. But she is thinking, despite that. Okay, so maybe this, uh, maybe we were a little too harsh on Katya. She looked ahead and found this move, queen b2 check. That is a very, very nice tactical sequence if, if she can pull it off. It looks a little bit like it shouldn't work. I mean, your nose tells you there's something wrong with it, but let's see, con analyze concretely. Check, king here, knight takes, rook takes, knight takes b2. And you were trying bishop to d6 earlier. I was trying um, bishop d6 for sure. Bishop right, d. The move was made. The right move against that check, queen b2, was king d3, boldly surging forward, insanity uh, for a human player to play. But king d3 is what the computer gives in this position, saying that white uh, was winning. Was winning. King d3, white's winning. That's what it said. But that's too computer-esque. Sorry, <laughs> okay. that was not to be found. Who's playing king d3 in that position except 2,700 players? That, that was fantastic. Instead, she's played the other move, which is fine for black. Now okay. black, it says, is in control of the position, and now it's maybe compensation uh, does white have for the lost exchange, but black should be fine in that position. And it's not saying better for black, it's saying even. Gotcha. Uh, sorry, yeah, it's saying Zero, zero, zero. Oh, God. <laughs> but <laughs> certainly not a draw yet. Bonded, but not a draw by any no, means. No, no, no. Not a draw. It's just saying an even position. Well, Meanwhile, in I'm... Irina's game, Irina's gotten down to two minutes herself. Oh, my. So as we've been looking at the other crucial battle for the women's championship, Zatansky um, versus Namkova, Victoria Ni has been in deep time pressure for the last ten moves, but now Irina joins her in the time pressure club. And all the ladies on the top two boards are in the Time Pressure Club this round. By the way, Abrahamian is completely winning. So all right. she's winning. If she wins and these ladies falter, we expect one of them to draw, or maybe both of them to draw, one to lose, one draw. Abrahamian, out of nowhere, will be playing a playoffs tomorrow. Right, but if one of them wins... One of them wins, it's over. It's over. It's over. But right now, neither of them is winning. In, Even in the crush game, she's not winning that position. So we've got a few more moves in the, in the game. C4 on the board, okay, so we'll that move kind back. of blunting the bishop, and Irina has attempted to get that bishop back into the game, kind of like some of the other variations that we were looking at. So bishop b7, c4 was played, bishop f3, bringing the bishop around. a4, I really like this move, a4, very, very much. Saying, screw getting the knight into the game, at least I can get my rook into the game. Well, well yeah, exactly. So a4 obviously prepares for a5, but again, uh, looky, 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 you got a king on h8, and that that king f is very frightening. If white can manage to get the, her rook on a1, which has absolutely been a laggard this whole game, never got into the battle, if it goes to a7, uh, troubles, troubles galore for yeah. our defending champion. May I add to that as well? Please. Remember we talked about the knight on... The knight on f8, f8. Larson's knight on f8. Never get mated. Never get mated. The knight's on c1. That's the mirror square. Mm -hmm. You're not getting mated. Put your king on b1. Get your rook active. You're not getting mated anymore. And the problem for a black, you can't break the dark squares. You have a light square bishop, so you can't break the dark square bind. King on b1, rook active in the game. You can't break through. You're going to have to hope your f-pawn makes it. You might have to trade queens to even have a chance to win this position. That's probably the only way now for black to win because the attack is dead. 
The attack is gone. She had this beautiful position. It's simply gone now. Moment White's rook gets into the game, it's going to be all about the end game and hopefully have a superior bishop with that pass pawn somehow trying to use that to win the game. But still, her king's exposed. So issues for White, she, for Black. She knows that something has gone wrong and she's in time pressure. So a bad situation for Irina Crush trying to have dominated, went from a dominating position to, oh my goodness, what's going on? And now she's under a minute on the clock. For the first time in the game, Irina Crush is under Victoria Nee in time. Incredible. A heart-stopping game. I mean, we are just going to have to keep our eyes on this. I will mention that Gata Kamsky and Ferdell have made time control, so we're going to go back to that game later. Lender Minakovian looks to be uh, heading towards a draw, so we're going to check in on those later. And meanwhile, we got to look at the time pressure insanity that's going on in the Women's Championship. And we have uh, we have seen a queen offer. And a queen offer trade offer is on the board. With queen h6 by Irina, and Victoria must her confidence must be soaring. I always liked it when I was in time trouble and the roles reversed and my opponent suddenly was in time trouble. E each time, with each second that was ticking past my on my opponent's clock, I felt better and better. Queen h6 was played. Victoria said, thank you very much. Let's trade queens. My king is safe. I'm going to play a5, of course, and I'm going to get my rook into the game and no issues that I can see. Uh, she, a5 is already on the board. She's trading on b6. Her rook is in the game. Her rook is... What? Uh, and sorry, now they're going to make time pressure quite quickly because I probably uh, we're to, actually on move 38 already. After queen takes h6, rook takes h6, pawn takes b6, a takes b6 on the board, both with over a minute and a half the, now. The bishop is on g4, yes. That's what, that's uh -huh. what was the mistake. She played, uh, she played yeah. bishop g4 at, before, a move before. Okay. So now after this trade... This, this rook is the position go. we have on the board. This rook can jump in, rook a7. No, that hasn't been played yet. But now there are only two moves to make t time control, and Victoria Nee has played rook to a7. Absolutely. And we no longer think that time will be a factor, at least not in this control. And, not exactly. a, and position's not a factor either. Why should no. white lose this with the rook on the 7, the bad black king? That pawn is the only hope, but... It doesn't seem as if it's going to be that much trouble. Rook on f7 is going to slow that pawn down. Oh, big time. And don't forget the bishop is. And she's taking off her protection. sweater. She's ready <laughs> for the, f the second time control. I think Victoria's knee confidence wasn't that high. She thought, I might get just <laughs> well, crushed in this time control. My king might get snared. And now she's like, hey, well, we're going to be sticking around for another hour. Exactly. And from Victoria's perspective, it's so easier f easy for her to play. She'll play moves like king c3 and b4, trade off another pair of pawns, and prepare to bring her knight from c1. The danger has absolutely passed, and I don't see Arena uh, winning this game, but she has played rook h7, uh, recognizing, of course, that, that uh, rook on rook a7 is it's too much. You've got to get rid yeah. of that. Now, I would say I don't want to bring the black king into the game. There's no reason why I should take trade rooks. I'd want to keep my rook. I agree. And I would play rook a6, going well, after the b6 pawn, followed by king c3 and b4. I like that, but I wonder if she'll do that just because in time control, people are so apt to make trades, you know? That's the problem. Rook a6. This is the 40th move, and she's done it, so she's yes. played your move. Yeah, she's played the right move, absolutely. Keep the active rook. Don't let that king get active. And she Murray. gets her 30-minute bonus, and now it's Irina crushes turn to make her 40th move, which you certainly will make. So let's uh, let's turn it over to Anna Zatonsky and Nemkova, who are on move 39, with by less way, than a minute on their boards as well. By the way, the computer is saying that now black's better. Black is actually for choice in that position. In, in Irina's game? No, not in, in Irina's game. That game is it's saying it's just, it's just even. Okay. But in this game, it's saying the exchange is an exchange, is an exchange, and you can't keep the knight on d4, so issues are beginning to erupt on the board, and Anna and no longer has the advantage that she thought she was enjoying with the grip on the position. Once she missed that king d3 winning move, the game has completely flipped. A fascinating tactic by Nemkova that was a bit of a bluff, but it worked, and now Anna may be in trouble. She, not, not losing, not losing, not much better, but a little bit worse, might mean that she can only draw this position, which means, guys, if Abrahamian wins the game, which it looks like she's on her way to doing, then it's a three-way tie for first in the women's section, and if Komsky wins, it's a three-way tie for first in the men's section as well. <laughs> Check those playoffs. It's crazy in here now. See, that and indeed, then, but that's going to take us right up to the closing ceremony. You're right. Those playoffs. Now, we, we should and mention that. And we just that see a crazy move, by the way. We, 
Oh, and well, give it to a us. really, really nice move by Nemkova. Knight c3. Holy cow, you thought that knight was offside there on a4 for a moment. Knight c3, Ooh, give me the one. pawn on e4. If you take the knight, rook takes d6, and it's Anna Zatonsky's position that would be collapsing in that case. That can't happen, but now that Namkova has developed her knight to c3, uh, I'm, I'm with uh, Maurice on this one. Uh, Anna is an exchange down, and... Uh, and she just played her 40th move, Anna Zatonsky. She's played 40 e5. Oh, Katarina no. Nemkova's got 20, 21 seconds left. She's This is her final move, and then she's going to get her bonus time. And she I'm has played knight to e4. Knight e4, knight d5. She, she played knight e4. Knight e4 was her choice. Wow. Huge developments in the top ladies' games. Uh, swings and... Everything. This the, the, this round has everything. Incredible. And now Nimkova is no longer losing. First of all, she played like a beast. I mean, how strong did she play those moves? Okay, she missed King D3. A lot of people would miss King D3. Mm -hmm. That move was not obvious at all. I didn't see it right away either. Uh, I think you didn't see it right away either, Yaz. Yes, Absolutely. King D3, what? What are you doing? Yeah. She played this fascinating tactic, sacrificing her pawn on C5, playing Queen B2 check, then dropping the knight on C3, picking up an exchange. Now this rerouting tactic of the knight on C3? I mean, she has acquitted herself quite well in the first, in her first U.S. championship. Man, you can bet the ladies are thinking, we got to deal with her in the future? <laughs> Not another one. <laughs> right. We were talking about Iswaran, the youth movement coming up. Katarina Nemkova showing her stuff, too. She played very confidently this game. I was very impressed. No collapsing. Uh, no, not even like a like a horrible position at any point. She did miss brilliant tactics. I mean, brilliant computerized tactics. But she's only human. Uh, fantastic moves in this game. I'm really impressed by this. She new might player. have even seen that King D3 was a possibility and still gone for it in the time pressure. Well, I mean, what else could she do? Yeah, Her position. Exactly. Sometimes you got to bluff in chess, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Poker, yeah. yeah. But wow, great stuff. And in the men, Josh Friedel. I don't know what's happening in the God of Kamsky Yeah, let's take a look at God of Kamsky Friedel, because that right there could decide the championship. So Josh Friedel really trying to fight here, and if he does, it'll be a, a two-way tiebreak between Lenderman and Nikobian, and we'll have a brand new U.S. champion. On the other hand, Josh loses, God of Kamsky will be the heavy favorite. Going, uh, Gata got the two, Gata, Gata got the two bishops. How do you like that one? Uh, uh, White has the two bishops. Uh, but the bishop on g1, it's going to require f2, f3 for liberation. Pawn on c3, a little bit weak. I, e6 weakness. Um, hard to say at the moment, but it sure looks like uh, God is for choice. I should put it that way. Um, he still has to do some recovering with his bishops. He's got to play like f3, bishop f2, and so on. Whew! And let's take a look actually at wow. our other big game. I know it's not the, the thrill fest, but these guys do have the best scores in the tournament. And I'd also like to point out something that I think both Grandmasters Ben Feingold and Maurice Ashley have complimented Lenderman on his fighting spirit. Veruja Nikobian on move 30. If you want to go back to move 30, we don't have to look sure. at all the moves, but we can just look at the position. After move 30 in this position, remember I asked you if you had to pick a side, what would you pick? Well, no according to an arbiter here at the U.S. Chess Championships who also works for the club, Alex Marler, Veruja Nikobian offered a draw on move 30. And Lenderman said, no, let's no. keep playing. Okay. And that was on move 30 when I asked you, if you had to pick a side, what right. would you pick? Because you said black, because maybe on a very good day, yes. the e pawn could get fancy. Exactly. So we're really showing strength of character, especially since, honestly, if this game ends up being a draw anyway, He's going to have burnt a lot of time, and you know now he's going to have less time to prepare for God of the Beast. <laughs> so that really shows tremendous <clears throat> character to keep fighting. And uh, all along, that's what uh, some of his fans have been saying, why they think he deserves to win this championship. Well, is that... Sorry, yeah. Uh, sorry. Please. Remember the same thing. Uh, it's not the exact same thing, but remember last year, the Singfield Cup, critical game by, <laughs> by uh, Magnus Carlsen. Remember... If he draws, he wins the whole thing. That was a different case, obviously, because a draw actually wins the whole thing, but he continued to play. Here, it's probably clear to Lindemann that he had no real losing chances, although, Yaz, you preferred black in that position. And so 
seeing him not accept a draw, I've had conversations with him. We've uh, gone on walks, uh, you know, the two, the two Brooklynites, Irina and, and uh, Alex, we, we've gone on a couple of walks just uh, after dinner, and we get into these kind of conversations. And I'm impressed by the young player. He understands that the fans want to see a fight to the finish. He articulated that very clearly. He said, what's the big deal? It's a position. Keep playing. And that's his feeling on it, that these draw offers are unnecessary because you can just play to a draw. So watching him show heart is incredible. It's wonderful to see. And I agree. This is why I pegged him as the champion. Okay, it may turn out uh, not in his favor in the, in the playoffs tomorrow, but he's showing that he's got the heart to keep playing and do what it takes in order to be a champion. He's certainly gained a lot of new fans in this tournament, Alexander Lenderman. Um, Remember that name. <laughs> we'll be seeing a lot more and, of him. And what about the position? Ahead. It still looks uh, drawish, but I got to give uh, Lenderman credit that he's put. He's keeping the pressure on a Kobian. Uh, there is a pawn hanging on h5, and uh, well, there's rook c4. There's rook ideas. C4 still keeps the balance, right? Yeah, rook c4 and against rook h4 I have e4. So I, if it's bar to move, let's just make a move for it bar. It is bar to move right now. Okay, let's just play a move like f5. Okay, so what else to do? You gotta take this pawn, right? Rook takes pawn. Uh, uh, rook c4. Like, give me this pawn. You gotta give me a check. I don't see a better move than check king over. Now, if you take my pawn on a6, that's no problem. I'm going to play rook takes uh, b4 and be very happy. If you play the move rook b6, I'm going to play a5, and I'm just going to shut you down and force a draw. I'm thinking that if you take, if you go rook b5 check, I'll play king d4 or king e4. If you play pawn takes, I'll play rook takes, and my king is actually, <coughs> pardon me, very uh, active in ideas of King d4, king e4, rooks, rook, king d4, rook a2 check, I see an easy draw for black. I'm afraid to say that this game looks more and more increasingly likelihood of a draw. So, a very well fought draw and a lot of interesting a story behind it. A hard fought draw with drama and That's content. Right. Yeah. And so now we're going to keep our close eyes on Gada Kemsky, but first we're going to take a little break. So, stay with us because. We are going to go all through the time control here because we are really um, going to keep our eyes peeled on the Anna Zatonsky game. If we she got loses, you know, we might have uh, a tie break between Irina Crush and Tatev Abrahamian. Absolutely. So stay tuned, and as usual, we got some Fisher fun for you.
welcome back to the 2014 U.S. Championships and U.S. Women's Championship, our potential finale today, at least in the Women's Championship, whereas in the U.S. Championship, we are definitely going to see the tension increase tomorrow with the playoff. Mm -hmm. But first, did you guys solve that Fisher puzzle? We do have uh, Grandmaster Maurice Ashley with this position from, of course, the famous World Championship 1972 match. I think you guys might remember who won that one. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> Indeed, in that game, uh, we know it was Bobby Fischer who dominated the match. After, by the way, going through the candidates like an animal, just eating up everybody who was in his way, whether it was Tainmanov, uh, who's he? Let's beat him 6-0. Larson, uh, we'll beat him 6-0 too. And he did almost the same thing to Petrosian. I mean, gee. And then against Spassky, same thwonk. After losing the first game, forfeiting the next uh, he ended up coming back and dominating that match as well. And this is one of the games from that match that he dominated. Uh, I believe it was the sixth game off the championships. And, of course, uh, his queen's under attack. I'm sure everybody found the bone cruncher. Rook takes on F6, pawn takes, and then just rook takes. This king is not long for the world. Spassky played a couple of moves. He played the move king to G8. He really can't save this pawn for long. And now bishop to C4, and this E pawn is all you need to see. Black's pieces will never breathe again. And so after King H8 just making time control, Queen F4 hitting this pawn, threatening Rook F8, that's all she wrote, and Spassky resigned. So another dominating victory by Bobby Fischer. Guys? I use that game. Uh, I thought it was one of the great modern brilliancies in my book, Winning Chess Brilliancy. But what was really special for Bobby Fischer after that game Boris Baskey applauded Bobby after the game, publicly just like, wow, it was a fantastic victory. Speaking of victories, we've had enormous turnarounds in the game between Anna Zatonsky and Katya Nemkova. I believe that uh, Anna has just made a crucial error with the move F4, F5. Already, uh, probably in this position, Exchange down, she has a pawn, slightly worse for white. F5, however, allows black this opportunity to play pawn. F6 takes E5, which completely undermines the bishop on, G on D6, and white's position is simply collapsing after this capture on um, E5. So this is a huge turnaround. And then again, another so just game. just after, for instance, F takes E6 check. F takes E6 check. Which was surely uh, Anna's idea that somehow she would be creating more play with this. But right. Now, King F6. After King F6 and Knight F3, I guess we would have to play. Well, then we've got this nice little move. Knight takes D6 and the... Everything is just coming off the board. Everything comes yeah. off the board. And King takes E6. And it's all over in that game. In the other game, Arena is very uh, unhappy because with this uh, moves b3, b4, and the king came to uh, capture this pawn on b4 when we left it. We had just seen the end of the time control, rook a6, rook e6 moves. b4 by Victoria captures. King comes to b3, king up, king takes, king up. And now, I think, is Victoria to play here? Yeah, Victoria Do we still to have play, to? Yeah. She can bring her knight out. She can play d4, d5, d3, d4, d5. And no problems whatsoever for Victoria. She's well on her way to earning a hard-earned draw. In this case, if Anna Zatonsky loses, Arena draws, we have another important game. So let's take a look over to Tatev. You know, earlier in the, tour, in, in the round, we weren't really paying that much attention to Tatev Abrahamian because we figured chances are the two top seeds in the tournament, one of them will win and this game will be irrelevant. But right. that's not turning out to be true at all, is it? This game yeah. is now could become very relevant if Irina Crush does not win her game. Precisely so. And we see uh, an overwhelming position, actually, for black. Uh, queen, queen dominating on G3, protect a uh, pass pawn on a C4. Uh, Camilla is trying to create a fortress, but way behind in material. It's 
it's impossible to save this position. Black will just uh, slowly but surely make progress. Yeah, in fact, put her we bishop can on d5. C4. Anytime this game might just end, you know, Camilla exactly. might just say, I've had enough after Tatev uh, proves herself with a few more accurate moves. So exactly. So if Tatev wins, Tatev Irina looks Drews. like she will win. And if Irina draws, I still think a lot of. I still think anything could happen in that game only because I think they're going to get in time pressure again. Mm -hmm. You know, with all, with 20 minutes each on the clock now, mm -hmm. it's going to be another case of what we saw in Anna and Irina's game where Irina said her coach said, expect to play the longest game of your life. <laughs> That's going to apply to this game as well all right. against Victoria and me. But yes, uh, Tatev has played the move C3 and is... She's cruising. And I mean, Maurice, uh, just, your uh, insights. coming up the board. Well, just looking at Irina's face there, you could tell that she is not upset, is not happy, and is upset with what's happened. She just can't believe that she blew such a gorgeous position, and Victoria Nee knows that she's just fine now. And I don't see how this actually lasts much longer, to tell the truth. The move D4 has been played in the game, and when you look at this position, what's likely to happen here? What's likely to happen is this pawn is going to fall somehow. It's just almost no question. Maybe not, maybe fall is too strong a word. It's going to get traded off. If this pawn gets traded off, this pawn is the only thing left in black's position. And at in the minimum, you'll be able to sacrifice a knight for this pawn. So what is the most that, that uh, Irina Crush can look for? It's a bishop and rook versus rook ending. That's the most she gets, that's the, in her wildest dreams, that's the position she gets. A bishop and rook versus rook ending. Now that we know is thorny, and people have been known to lose that one quite easily. We actually saw another type of minor piece ending happen in this uh, tournament where Anna Zatonsky defeated Camilla Beginskaite in a rook and knight versus rook ending. So if, if Irina can dream of ever getting that, she'll take it for now. But the reality is this d-pawn is annoying, and the move d5 is coming, king b5 is coming, this pawn might actually fall straight, might drop for nothing. This knight also has been relegated to defensive duty for so long, but it could head to the e5 square, and then you'll be trying to take that piece off the board. So definitely a lot of chances, and I would say easy chances, easy chances for the player with the white pieces, Victoria Knee, to just make this game a quick draw. I don't see Irina winning this game. I really don't even see it lasting to that time pressure situation, to be honest. I think that Irina has simply blown it and has made this position very easy. You see, you saw Victoria get up from the board right there saying, um, I'm not losing this, come on. I just don't see them offering a draw. Therefore, I think that they're gonna get, uh, they're gonna get to those final moves anyway. I don't see a player offering a draw. I think they're going to use a lot of time. Oh, I don't think there's going to be a draw in acceptance either. I think they'll play either to a very, very simplified exactly. position. Exactly. Uh, that's what I think. And I think that's certainly going to take time because they want to be careful. But here's the question. If Arena was given the choice of whose position she would prefer to play for a win, would she prefer to have Black's position or White's position? Maurice is making the case that uh, of the two players who may have the best winning chances, maybe Victoria's uh, winning chances are actually better than her opponents. And I don't disagree. Uh, I think this ideas of knight c3, knight d3, e5 are very compelling, as are d5 and king b5 and rook takes b6. And I've got two connected pass pawns in the center. So I still see... Um, and d4, king g5 have been played. Okay. Um, so, so this game's going to last uh, definitely a little bit longer, in my opinion. Um, meanwhile, let's look at Gatikanski's game against Josh Riddell. Sure, absolutely. Because that game is uh, obviously very critical for us. Okay, I'll just bring that one up on our screen. That's our second game. And let's see. Uh, material still even. A lot of black pawn weaknesses still. And... And you mentioned that we really want to get that bishop on g1 um, extricated by playing f3 at the right moment. Exactly. So I just see, okay, first of all, let's just go back a few moves so we can get a, a sense of what has happened in the meanwhile. So Gata has played the move c3, uh, c4, queen b4, attacking the rook on e1. The rook scooted over, rook f1, change on c4, a swap, and rook d8, queen e4, and this is the position we have on our board. So I see 
got a playing. Gata's moves are rather easy to play, by the way. F3, bishop e2, and maybe just start pushing that uh, c pawn forward. From black's point of view, it's not so easy. This rook on f6 doesn't really have a role at the moment. It may well drop back over here to f7, a7, try to get counterplay with his a pawn. But uh, Josh Friedel is going to have to find some really excellent moves to uh, stay in this game, in my view. And let's take a look and see if there's any action in the Verusia Nikolovi and Lenderman game. As we mentioned earlier, Lenderman choosing to fight on in a position where you think that it's going to be a draw, despite well, the maybe, pawn that White may, managed to win. Maybe VAR is playing for the win now. Because um, that king activity just... I, how did that king get there? <laughs> Indeed. Well, let's remember a, a long, long, long time ago, you, you would ask yeah, me... Yeah, you about, mentioned that you would prefer to be black because in your wildest dreams, the king it, might end up... <laughs> on, on a very good day, on a very good day, the e pawn could be uh, worthwhile. Okay, king d3, king d5, king c3 was played. Check, king b3. Definitely, uh, Lenderman is doing his very, very best to play for a win. But guess what? This is serious, serious counterplay. E4, King D4, and Black's <laughs> Black's idea is as as clear as a uh, as a brisk. The king plays <laughs> a day, a uh, brisk whole day. You would just want to play E3. Oh, it's maybe nice that your rook on C6 cuts my king off. You know, typical endgame technique, strategy idea, so in order to stop this pawn, we're going to have to bring our rook into the play. Right, and rook e6, and so your Lenderman is probably going to have to essay the move rook uh, h8, e3, and if you check from behind, you're not doing that great a no, deal. You you're just helping me. I thought you were going to go on the f3 side. Or even on the f3 side, agreed. Because um, our, our, our pawn on f6 nicely blocks any checks or even attacks by you. Uh, I mean, you could try b5 to keep things kind of interesting, but it doesn't. Lo it looks like I've, I've gone a little bit too far. So exactly. So after e3, let's uh, try. You have to move rook to c5, guys. Uh, in the moment when you played, when you played rook h5, rook c5 is tricky. So at this moment, after instead of rook h8, you mean? Yes. Yeah, so instead of rook h8, Maury is actually suggesting rook to c5, and we got to check this pawn end game. <laughs> so if you go right away, the king comes back to c2, and meanwhile, if you had played king d3, then white would be queening one move earlier, right? Precisely. So king d3, c6, and neither person queens with check, so um, winning, you, you're going to be happy with white, right? So exactly. instead, the officer just pushing the uh, pawn immediately to uh, e3 instead, which for forcing king c2, and now after king and takes this c5. Is good. And this is just great for, uh, great for white. So, so rook c5 takes, takes, takes. h4? I don't know. It's a crazy king and pawn ending. Uh, I'm and we do have an official sure. result in the game with uh, Tatev Harbarhamian and Camilla Bahenskaiti. Tatev has won her game. Wow. So now uh, we're going to get her thoughts on not only her own victory, but what she thinks about Irina Krasnodzintanski's chances and whether she might find herself in a playoff tomorrow for the U.S. Women's Chess Championship. This, How uh, sweet it is. And who knows? I mean, this game now, uh, it seems like they didn't shake hands. They continue to play. And... You know, weird things can happen. Absolutely. Weirder things can happen, and we might see no playoff in the championship, but a playoff in the women's. That's wild, wild. And here she is, Tata Babarhamian is with Maurice Ashley. A fantastic result here at the women's championship, six and a half points. Indeed, thanks, Jen. I'm with Tata Babarhamian after her victory against Camilla Baginskaite. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Well, we were not even seriously paying attention to your game. I'm going to admit that right now. We thought that the top two boards were the deciding factors. The numbers were really high against you being in this position. But suddenly you find yourself after a victory, possibly in a playoffs tomorrow. Did you think this could be possible? Well, I knew it was possible, but I didn't think it could actually happen. So, <laughs> I mean, I still don't think it's actually going to happen, so I'm just not going to think about it. But I Elliot told me it's going to happen, so. <laughs> Elliot, yeah, you, Elliot told me a so. friend of yours. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what did he say is going to happen? They're both going to lose and you win or a, some kind of draw a, a combination? Uh, 
some kind of combination. So we might have to listen to this guy because he comes out of Caesar's Palace in, yeah, <laughs> in Las Vegas, knows so <laughs> he knows odds. <laughs> well, to, kudos to him. When you came into this game, did you, what were you thinking sitting at the board? First, first move. Um, I was just mentally trying to get ready for a long game. I didn't want to think about the results or anything like that. I just didn't want to put any pressure on me. And then as the game started to progress, like I thought my position was uncomfortable, so I, I wasn't thinking about results at all or their games. So I was just like, okay, just try to find good moves. But then the game turned around. At some point, the F file opened, uh, and, and suddenly your king, her king was a little drafty, and then she just opened up, and then suddenly you were just surging through. Yeah, things happened really fast after A4. I think maybe she reacted badly. Once the center kind of uh, opened up a little, and then I maneuvered my knight, and then... She, I had a pass pawn on C4, so I thought things are going well for me. Yeah, that pawn proved to be a problem. Right here, uh, she, she, you play this check, she blocked with her rook, and then you play the winning move. Queen takes E3. Obviously, she can't take your queen. Uh, the game is effectively over. So what are you thinking about now? Are you, are you still thinking that they're going to win somehow, some miracle, or you think maybe you have a chance to get into the finals? I mean, I, I really don't want to think about it. <laughs> I don't want to get my hopes up, and I don't want to like give up or anything. I I haven't even been looking at their games, so I don't even know what's going on. I think on, well, on let's, game looks let's very bring you up to speed. Then uh, we'll go first to this game. Well, on this board, at least the where, computer says on this where board. <laughs> this pawn's about to go, and uh, this pawn will be under control. But it looks as though Black. What do you think? Black has. Uh, White has some reasonable fighting chances here? Um, I mean, so many crazy things happen in this tournament. So <laughs> I'm, I'm sure she's so losing both pawns, right? So she's losing this one. Looks like that one's yeah, going to go. As well. that, if both of them go, they could be a problem. Yeah, there is this little, little straggler on this side. Mm. All right, so that one's not clear. But Let I don't think Black's going to lose. I mean, she can just give up her knight at some point, probably. Right, Black is not going to lose that position. But in this position, White, the computer is saying, is now winning. Much better, at least. I, I don't see maybe a, a rook and knight versus rook ending like we saw Camilla lose against uh, Zatonsky earlier in the tournament. What are your thoughts on this one? I mean, it's kind of hard to have my own thoughts when the evaluation is right here. Um, oh, you can but, think without <laughs> the computer. I mean, just uh, looking at the position from a practical standpoint, do you think that this is black's gonna lose this game? Um, I mean, I don't think it's so easy because that F pawn might, if the F pawn starts moving, I mean, it can right now because of the pin, but I think white has to play a little accurate too. Indeed. Well, we know you're in a tough position with a lot of tension. What are you going to do now to, to yeah, us? It's a terrible position. I can't even have a drink because I might have a playoff <laughs> tomorrow. <laughs> Indeed. Well, we wish you the best of luck. Thanks for the fighting spirit you've showed in this tournament, and good luck. Hopefully you get into the playoffs. Thank you. With Tatev Abrahamian, after a victory that's put herself in a sweet spot, she might be going into a serious game tomorrow for the U.S. women's title. Guys. No drinks Bravo. for Tatev and no chicken drinks. wings for Maurice tomorrow. Absolutely. That's my prediction. Absolutely. But she will find out within about an hour whether or not she can drink or not. Although it's kind of funny that she's hoping she can't relax, right? Right. Yeah. You're hoping you don't get to relax. <laughs> well, it's, I, I mean, she's just so very, very pleased that she's in this position. Um, in the game that I just brought up, the game of Anna Zatonsky, uh, crucial game. It does look like Anna's uh, protected pass, pa pass pawns on d6 and e7 are about to fall. After, for example, king takes, knight takes d6, um, black is going to be very quick to play king at e7 and king takes. So maybe our only hope is to try to go after that a pawn. Right. And I was so thinking that, that maybe after rook takes a2, you should pr perhaps consider knight takes uh, c2 and after knight takes d6, immediately going after this pawn on the a file. And that did happen, actually. Anna did play knight takes d6, knight, take, knight to b4 here. Right. So that after the, so at least you're bringing the, the a pawn a little bit closer to both uh, white's uh, king and knight. Right. So, so after a5, knight c6, you're both making it harder for black to just snatch e7. Precisely. And you're getting ready to play king b2, c3, b4. And... The game is um, not totally over. Not totally over at all. Um, I'm just 
Uh, I mean, it looked like even worse for White a few moves ago. Right. Like you were thinking that it was really going to be chopped like up for Namco. Exactly, exactly. And that is not the case. So, for example, we could, we, we could also toss in just a little bit of a deeper look into this position for a moment. After the move, knight d8, denying Black's king the opportunity to play king f7, after f4, there is this nice little move, knight d6, picking knight b7, attacking the knight on d6, picking up a tempo so that we do get uh, over here and snapple this mm -hmm. apart. You get that pretty quickly, yeah. Yeah, I'm thinking so that this is getting closer to a draw, and instead of a loss for Anna, she may be, ways. she may be, but she I, may be there with a draw, which would be a, another remarkable turnaround because we thought she was lost. But remember, with time pressure on the clock, I really think still Victoria Crash. I kind of agree with uh, Tatev that who knows what's going to happen. Although I, I, Victoria Nee actually just played an interesting move. So instead of just going after the B pawn, she's played the move Rook A8. Actually, instead trying to perhaps embarrass the king on G5 or. For instance, play the move rook to g8 check, mm -hmm. which would result in a kind of some unpleasant king decisions here for black, right? right. Because if we go to the h file, then we check with the rook on h1, and suddenly your bishop would have to interpose, after which knight f2 or knight f4 is not what you had in mind. Well, if you could just win the f4 square and be able to play knight f4, that would be huge. But I questioning Victoria's decision here. Maybe because she made the right move. G6. Yeah. Well, that is what Irina did, in fact. So she prevented the move rook g8 check by playing just the simple rook g6. Remember, this is a key move you wanted to play earlier in the game. Right. And I was right. just thinking that, actually, that I wanted to play king b5 and get my knight maybe maneuver. If I could go king b5 and maneuver my knight to c6, well, that would be all she wrote. The two pawns would just decide the game. Here, perhaps she's thinking that she could play a move like maybe rook d8 with the idea of d6. I'm a little bit confused by the move oh, rook a8. I remember in her game where she was doing really well, she also kind of lost the thread, you know? Mm -hmm. Who was that against? Is it against uh, Zatonsky or? She's had a number of uh, Where she had situations. a very nice position and um, started to kind of lose the thread playing a lot of forcey moves under time pressure. So. Uh, 13 minutes for Victoria Ni nee and Irina Crush, 15 minutes. Uh, regardless of what the position looks like, really, it's way too early to call, mm -hmm. in my view, and uh, anything is really possible in this game. Okay. And we've got uh, Alyssa Malakina, and she's going to talk about uh, her thoughts on the Women's Championship. And, you know, she beat Irina Zenyuk in this game. So, ended her tournament with a bang. Indeed, I'm with FM Alyssa Malakina who won her last game. It's always nice to go out with a victory in a tournament, isn't it? Absolutely, and especially against Zenyuk. I've had a terrible record against her before, so it feels nice to finally win and finish the tournament this way. So what would you evaluate your tournament experience like this time around? I know you have uh, been doing law school. You've been accepted to a, a new legal firm. You've started a new business, which is called? Sublight. Sublight, right? Sub subletting um, housing for college students. How do you evaluate this uh, time at the championship? I'm very happy with the way my tournament went. You know, I came in with different goals this time around because I did finish law school. I'm getting ready to take the bar. You know, I launched my startup. So my goal this tournament was to finish in the top half. And I think after this game, I tied for fifth. And overall, my goal was just to play fighting games each round, have no regrets, you know, bring my A game and you know, prove that it's possible to have a career and still be competitive, you know, keep the top players on their toes. So I'm definitely happy with, with the way things turned out. You had a big game against Irina Crush that really affected the standings in the championships, one that you might have lost. 